Well, we're currently studying through Paul's epistle to Titus. If you'll turn to Titus, we covered the introduction the first two weeks, and we have been learning much just from that introduction about the integrity uh, that makes a great leader, the things that a great leader is committed to. And we saw that Paul was committed to God's mastery of his life. He was a doulos. He was a slave to God. His life is over. It is now God's. Secondly, he was committed to God's mission. He was committed to evangelizing the elect, that they would have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was committed to the edification of the saints through the Word of God and the encouragement that Jesus Christ is coming again to restore all things to Himself and we are to encourage one another. This here is not our hope. That is the hope of the believer in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, he was a man then committed to God's message. Paul would not depart uh, to his own thoughts, his own words. He was devoted to God's message and that was Christ and Him crucified. He was committed to God's means. God uses uh, keruso. He uses preaching and proclaiming and sharing of this message. And then lastly, he was committed to God's men. Paul uh, loved people. He was devoted to these two men, Titus and Timothy. And we saw all the different names of, of Paul was engaged in lives and connecting. So if you just love truth without lives and pouring into people, you're missing the heart of this man and the mission that we've been given by God. Well, this morning we're going to get into the heart of the letter. Really, Paul's purpose for writing Titus was the need for the churches in Crete. And in verse 5, he tells them to set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city. And so we'll be focused this morning on the call to appoint elders in every city on this island of Crete. And this is such an important passage of Scripture because just giving it some thought and meditation this week, the elders are given a task in verse 9 to hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. And so this is a vital piece to the health of the church of God. As the leaders go, so goes the church. If you fail in this area, it's kind of like getting up in the morning and buttoning your shirt. I do this often, is if you start and miss that first button, every button will be off. You, you don't have leaders who are right. The whole church is just going to be off in so many different ways. So as I peruse the landscape of churches in our country, what I'm seeing is failing leadership. I see moral integrity that is failing greatly in our land. Teachers of sound doctrine, as their main role, have abandoned it for what's relevant, for what's popular, and what's emotional. Examples in the faith have become weak at best. We're seeing more and more just congregational-run churches. They look for humanistic qualities in their leaders. Are they charismatic? Are they entertaining and successful in business and movers and shakers, and we're more concerned about can they run a corporation versus their character and their commitment to this Word. What we are going to look at this morning is that God calls elders to lead His church. Men with a clear set of qualifications that must be met to lead the household of God well. And so as we open this up this morning, I just want the young men and and even just young boys, you know, I, I, every time I meet little six, seven, eight-year-olds, I say, I want someone to take my place. Would you pray about it? And I want these young men to really take this seriously and to, to start training and becoming this kind of a man right now. So I want you to listen, young men and older men, to say, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to aspire to. And then young women and, and the, the young girls, I, especially my young girls, Uh, This is what you want in a man to lead you. And so I want you to just see this morning, what what should I be looking for? I I don't care if he's got uh, big muscles or, uh, you know, just a great job and all these different things. Guys, this is what I want to see. Girls, this is what I want you to look for in a man. And don't settle. I I could bring up a line of of older ladies today who would come and say, you want to know what it's like if, if he's not this? I'll tell you the hurt and the pain and the destruction it brought into our family. And so I want you young ladies to just listen to these characteristics. Take them to heart and say, that's what I'm going to look for. I'm going to trust God for that kind of a man and not just settle uh, for some cute guy that doesn't have good doctrine. So demand this 
as a congregation of your leadership. Take pains in seeking these kind of men to lead you. And then I want you to pray for your leadership because you'll see this morning that your leadership needs grace to be these kind of men. It is impossible in your own strength. So we, we, we ask for prayer for the leadership of this church. And so we can fight for the purity of doctrine all of our days. But if we fail and our, our teachers and our leaders are corrupt, we will never get there. God, give this church holy men who know you and who proclaim your holy word. And so we want to look to God to teach us what our leaders should be this morning and that everyone in this room, that you would aspire to be this because I'll, I'll finish that this is what every man is to look like maybe absent the gift of teaching, but this is the qualities every man should shoot for and, and every woman looking for integrity and this kind of quality. So let's go before God, and, and I think it's one of the most important things for a church is to have this kind of a leadership. And so let's seek our God for those kind of men. Father, we come before you, and this is a powerful passage. I would love for another elder to preach it. God, I pray that you will meet us in a special way. I pray that you would give us men like this to lead us. Men who commune with the living God and are being conformed to his image. Men who labor hard and diligently to know and see your face in this word to proclaim it. God, men who can be examples in this day and age, day and age with morality falling apart. God, will you continue to hold your men who have been called to this role in this church. God, I'm praying this morning that you would hedge about their lives and their homes and their truth. God, protect them. Give them an amazing grace. Let them live into your power and your grace uh, to make them be these kind of men. And so, God, I thank you that you've loved this church. As I get to live and uh, rub elbows and lead with these men, I'm overwhelmed at what you have done in them. God, I, I praise you for that this morning. They are so dear, and they love you, and they love your word, and they love these sheep. God, that's a gift from you, and I just want to thank you for it. I don't want to take that for granted. And so we want to just join our hearts as a congregation and thank you that you have loved this church to give the kind of leaders that you have given to it. And so, God, I, I pray that you will raise up more, that this body will function like what we're going to learn in Titus, and that many young men and young women will be raised up in the faith to take the mantle and to, to run into this world that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, please be with us this morning. Do, do work supernaturally. God, we don't want natural things this morning. We want supernatural. So we pray that your word would be made clear, that your spirit would illuminate it to minds and hearts, and that you would conform us to the image of Christ. God, work in our midst. We open our hearts up to you. Do your work, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Titus chapter 1. Look with me. We're going to look at verses 5 through 9 this morning. Verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So Titus has been left on this large island of Crete, which is in the eastern Mediterranean. And it was highly civilized, a very well-developed uh, island. But it had it, it become corrupt, very corrupt. In fact, in verse 12 of chapter 1, it says, Cretans are always liars. They're evil beasts and lazy gluttons. Not a picture of what you want to be known for. That's, you know, wouldn't you love that? That's your city. You're just a bunch of lazy people who love food and you're liars. Yet right in the middle of this place, churches had sprung up and they had been spreading throughout this island. It's very encouraging on Crete. But there were some things that were lacking in these churches they, 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 that they needed for this church. And so Paul calls Titus to organize the church and appoint godly leadership to guide the, ch the churches on this island. And so we don't know exactly how the church started. In all my studies, I can't be dogmatic, but there's some speculation that it might have been Paul. But we know that there were some from Crete at Pentecost because we're told as the apostles began preaching, everyone was hearing it in their own language. One of those languages listed in Acts was Crete, Cretans. So maybe uh, someone got saved at Pentecost. They went back and they started a church on that island. Paul was there at some point, and again, I said it was probably after Acts 28. 
Paul goes there and he leaves Titus or he sends Titus shortly after he leaves. And there are two things then that Paul now says, Titus, here's what I want you to do on this island. Set an order. There's a root word in that, that the Greek is ortho, where we get the word orthodontist. And an orthodontist takes teeth and sets them straight. And it carried the idea to do it thoroughly and completely. So go into this island and set it straight. Get, get them straightened out thoroughly and completely. It's very chaotic in the church. So Titus is called to fix this. And it's a hard task due to the culture. It's a very difficult culture. And there were false teachers all over the island of Judaism. And they were sowing false teaching into the church. And so it, I can tell you this, it is harder to straighten out something after it's started than to start a church plant and just kind of begin with it. And so what's been given to Titus is a very difficult task to, to get this whole church back in order since they've already started. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to ask three questions then of the text that is before us in verses 5 through 9. First question, what, what are elders? And then secondly, how many elders should a church have? And thirdly, what should they look like is where we'll spend most of our time. First point, what is elders? Look with me in verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders, presbuteros, where you get the word presbytery. And so it's this idea of an elder. And verse 7, he uses a different Greek word, for the overseer must be above reproach. So, uh, it's a different word. So you can be an elder, a presbyteros, overseer, several titles and scriptures that are given to the elder. Today in our churches, we can call them pastors, bishops, overseers, elders. There's a lot of different terms in different churches. But these are the spiritual leaders of the church. These titles are given to the same man. If you are a pastor, you're an elder. If you're an elder, you're an overseer. All these titles are for one man. They're not separate offices. And so it's not a separate role as we even see today in some denominations where you have an elder. One's a leading elder and one's a teaching elder. There's, there's no such thing. It's one man that does both of those tasks. And so the government of the church is for elders to lead the flock of God. And that is the government here at Southside Bible Church. Elders lead this church, but they lead it according to God's Word the best we can in prayer and seeking to study and know it, but with congregational sensitivity and input. We shepherd the sheep of God. This isn't about us. And so we want to know you and know your hearts. And so it's never just, you know, we do whatever we want. We, we want to shepherd the best for you and for the good of God's kingdom. And so you'll notice that at this church, we don't have meetings to vote on the color of carpet and chairs and bulletins and all of that. Every decision, though, is made by the elder board, and it's for the good of this body and the kingdom of God. So what Paul says, appoint them. Appoint them. A, a church needs elders. Go and give them that authority. Appoint them. They need to be appointed by those who are in authority. Come lay hands on them. They are called by the Holy Spirit, and we are to appoint them into this leadership. And at our church, we, we use the congregation's help. You guys nominate who you see functioning in this way, and then the elders begin searching and finding out if this is indeed the case. And so I just one last point as I move on, though, is you're not then self-appointed as an elder. What I, what I see going on more and more in our, our country is someone says, you know, I got a burden for worship, and I'm going to start a church then that worships. And every, everyone just keeps popping up on their own. If they get a burden, they start a new church. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. And, and you don't go self-appoint yourself to begin a church and start. This is done by the authority that's given in, in elder boards to a, appoint and anoint and to send out. There's a protection to the body of Christ in doing it this way. So that's our first question then. What are elders? Elders are the overseers. They're, they're the pastors that guide and direct the church. My second question then is how many elders should a church have? And it's in our text is why I'm asking it. Uh, this is a very important point. As Paul says, appoint elders in every city. So it's in the plural. And so we know this, that at least more than one in every church in, in, in Crete. And so we're never told a maximum. I don't know how many elders are too many. You know, I'll let you know when we get there. <laughs> but, 
there's a, there's a minimum that he tells us at least two. And so the, and, uh, uh, let me just read a couple verses. Acts 14, 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church. So again, in the plural. Acts 20, 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. James 5, 14. If any is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let him pray over him. And so there, it's, it's in plural every time it's talked about in a church. And so here's why I think that is the case, is we all, we all have weaknesses and strengths, every one of us. And we need each other to balance and to protect ourselves from ourselves. So I think one of the most beautiful things in a good marriage when it's working well is all of your gifts are just working together and you're protecting each other from your weaknesses, from your strengths. And when a marriage is really working well, it's a beautiful thing that protects the whole family. And plurality is probably the sweetest gift that God has given to the church next to His Son. The more elders, you know, it, it can become a test of patience but it's beautiful for the protection of the body that if I get kind of off on something and run off, I, I can't get more than one step because there's a plurality of elders. So I've got some weaknesses that scare me. And so you guys are blessed because there's a plurality that keeps you from going off onto something. And so when you got churches with maybe one elder, it's, you're very prone to be led astray or get off on something. And so a plurality of elders is so beautiful in the body of Christ to protect it. And so we move as one, one Lord, one kingdom, one word, and we just, we stay there and we work through things to get that. And so I want you to see there's a beauty in plurality, and I think there's a danger in just one. And so that, that, I think that's why I'm saying appoint elders. It's a beautiful thing. One quick note. If you know a church with one elder, um, pastors not saying leave, it's unbiblical. Okay, I don't want you running out saying, Pastor Murphy said so. That's not true. Crete is an example. There's no elders. And it's a church. Go strengthen the churches. And I know many churches where they've had two elders and one leaves for a job or something different, and now there's just one. There's still a church. And they're seeking to raise one up and use other godly men in the church till they do. And they can use like fire where you call other pastors and get their counsel on things. And so don't, just because there's one elder, I'm not saying it's not a church. I'm just saying there's a, there's a biblical guideline to have two elders at least and to have that for safety and protection. And so that's the ideal and the goal is that we would have elders in every church. Young men wanting to plant a church, we've got about nine or ten of them. Uh, I love that. I love that that's your passion. So here's what I want to counsel you in. Find a dear, a dear brother who's elder qualified. You know, start growing together, training together, studying together. Uh, get with some of the older men in the church. Build those bonds so that when God leads you to plant, you now have a, another elder to go and you know each other very well. And so get lock shields. Find those guys. Be building and be thinking that way for the future. Lastly, this is where I want to spend most of our time this morning. What should they look like? What, what should an elder look like? What should we look for in our elders to lead our churches? Because we've already seen what an important role that they play, and so we've we got to make sure that we find the right ones and what God says they should look like. So Paul's going to give us a very detailed and descriptive list of what an elder should look like. And this is just such a vital role for the church of God that we've got to be very careful with who we put into such a position of authority and trust. You, you get the wrong guy in this position and he can hurt the church badly and greatly. So the men who will feed us the Word of God, they're going to feed us, they're going to teach us, and they're going to protect us from false teachers and wolves. The wolves are coming into our midst more than since we started this church. We need protection from the wolves. And we need someone then to manage the household of God. These all have eternal consequences. We're dealing with our eternal souls, and, and so this matters more than who runs your restaurant. This is, this is very important. Who runs my church? Who runs the protection of my eternal soul? Who feeds me the eternal Word of God? We can't just entrust this to anybody. This needs to be a man who is called by God and gifted by God, men full of the Holy Spirit, a man who knows and walks with God. He has been qualified by God Himself. And so I want to not get bogged down 
on any qualification since there's a bunch of them. I'm going to move through and just give you a general survey this morning. We could do a study on each one, but I don't think it would be as profitable as just looking at a quality in a portrait. So there, there, I, I call this painting a portrait of, a, of character that is controlled by God and led by Him, one who will be faithful in shepherding the flock of God. And so what we have seen personally and in the Bible and throughout the world, if this position is not held by these kind of men, the sheep are in great danger and the name of God will be blasphemed among the Gentiles. So we gather to put on display the name of God. And if this fails, we'll, we'll hurt the name of God more than we'll put it to glory. And Paul said, I'd rather die than make my boast in Christ an empty one. I'd rather die than this church not give glory to God. And this is a very important role for our church. And so let's look at the portrait of a shepherd. I'm going to break it down into three categories. I think the first one that Paul addresses is his family. And then he addresses kind of his inner and outer character, maybe his, his personal qualities and his interpersonal qualities. And then lastly, he addresses his teaching. And so I see this general heading, if you'll look with me then in verse 6. Namely then, if any man is above reproach, and he says it again in verse 7, for the overseer must be above reproach reproach. I, I just see that as kind of a general heading, and then the other descriptives show what does that mean. And so I think the rest of these qualities will describe what it means to be above reproach. But the, the Greek word for above reproach, it means without fault. You are unchargeable, without indictment. It really gets into court kind of settings. And so that you, no one can charge you. No one can indict you and bring you into court. You're really unchargeable. You're not perfect no way, but you're blameless and you deal with your sins and you confess them and you're, you're growing. And so it's, it's not a call to perfection, but someone who's blameless. And so it is one without a mark, vice, or defect. There's nothing in your life, past or present, that would disqualify you from being a model to follow in the church of God. And the hope is then there'll be nothing in your future that will bring an indictment on the church of God. So this is very important. It's really someone who could be a role model. That is what the church needs is models to follow. I think that's what God wants from His shepherds. Listen to Philippians 3.17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. Walk in that pattern, Paul says. 2 Thessalonians 3.9. Not because we do not have the right to do this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you that you might follow our example. Hebrews 13, 7, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and consider the result of their conduct and imitate their faith. In 1 Peter 5, 3, not lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. I want someone to show me how to live this way. I love serving on this elder board because these men are teaching me how to live this way. And so God's going to raise up some men who, who you'll be able to say they're not perfect, no way. But they're, 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 they are seeking God and they're, they're models that I can, I can follow. I can follow in a day when, uh, don't, don't make sports your models, Hollywood or singers. Go find men of God to follow. So let's look at the character of his home. Look with me in verse 6. So namely, if any man's above reproach, here, here's the area in his house that he needs to be above reproach. He's the husband of one wife. And this has brought up a lot of debate and controversy in the church because really a misinterpretation, I think, of this word. Uh, it, it, someone will say that if you're not married, you can't be an elder because you don't have one wife. And that, that would take out Paul and Jesus. I think that can't be right. They say it's, it's against polygamy. You can't have you know, two wives at once. Or they say if you've been divorced biblically or widowed, and then you get remarried, you can't be an elder because now you've had two wives. And that, I think, misses the whole word of what Paul's looking at. One thing that will help us this morning with many of these qualities is that they're current character qualities right now. What faithfulness looks like today in their lives and why they can be leaders. Not something they did 25 years ago when they were an unbeliever. And so he's coming and he's dealing with present current qualities. The literal Greek here is it would be translated, he's the husband of one. A better translation I think would be he's a one woman man. 
This is a man that is faithful to his wife. He is in a covenant. He's in a covenant before God with his wife. And he loves his wife like Christ loved the church. He's laying his life down, serving her, nurturing her, caring for her, wanting to present her holy on that last day. I treat her as a weaker vessel. I'm tender with her and I'm kind. And so this is a man who's absolutely devoted to his wife. He's not harsh or abusive with her. He leads her in love, and she is happy to be led by him. That's usually the first question we ask a wife. Is she happy to be led by him? I think this is calling for a man not to be a flirt, a womanizer, chasing women. His heart wandering from her. He is committed to the wife of his youth. The beauty of this and our perverted and twisted day and age is, is amazing. And he's not one into porn. He's not chasing women. This is a man who's pure. And this is crucial to an elder. Show me a man who treats one who is in a role that is submissive to his authority like his wife with love and kindness and patience and I'll show you a man who can lead a church with people who are in submission to his authority. Be abusive to your wife and you'll do shipwreck in the church of God. And so this is a great place to look to see how are they going to be when they're elders in a church. Let's, let's start and just see how they treat their wives. Let's begin there. Nothing will bring a reproach quicker to the church of God than adultery. The name of God has been drugged in the mud by adulterating and immoral leaders Appoint men who are one women, men. Secondly, he says, having children who believe, in verse 6, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. And so you can imagine that this one has caused a lot of confusion as well. These first two are really most of the debated ones, and then the other ones seem to get easier. So is, is this saying, having children who believe, that the elder must have kids who believe the gospel and are Christians? And there's just been many hermeneutical gymnastics trying to figure this out and force it and come to the conclusions. So if being an elder means all your kids are elect, I think our rule here should be you've got to have 10 kids. I mean, we would advance the kingdom of God greatly if the, if the elders just kept having kids because they're going to be saved. It's guaranteed. So you cannot be an elder until all your kids are saved. Can you be an elder if you don't have kids at all? What about kids who have already moved out and are adults now? All of these questions come in, and here's where we kind of landed as an elder board when we studied it out early in the church. The same word translated here for belief. Children who believe, it can have two different interpretations as well, and context is going to have to determine it, so it can be having children who believe or having children who are faithful. Both of those are translations of this Greek word. And so the same word, it's interesting, it's used in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word. There it's translated faithful, same word. So it can be translated believe or faithful. And the reason I think it's faithful is because of the modifying phrase here in verse 6. They're not accused of dissipation or rebellion. And so I think it's that they're these faithful kids and they're not accused of dissipation, which means uh, to waste and squanderous living. They're these people just squandering their lives away in sin and rebellion. Rebellion, fighting their parents, going against everything they teach. You, you, you've seen that teenager, they're just punks, and they're rebellious, and they fight on everything, and he's saying, that isn't what they're to be. This is about the testimony of the church of God. They're, they're kids who are, are rebelling and publicly bringing a reproach on their dad and their church. Paul's saying that can't be it. God doesn't want that for his church where they're just bringing down. You're preaching Jesus and they're going and destroying his name all day, every day. This is a call to be a parent who trains, leads, rebukes, guides, instructs, exercises authority in a way that his kid respects his dad. I remember I went into a home once doing oversight and this guy had a lot of kids, and every one of his kids shared about how much they respected their dad. That was, that was the general flow of every kid, and it went up from 20s all the way down. And it's, that's the picture. It's just one who leads well, these kids respect their dad. 
he admires, they, they admire his faith and his kindness and his love and his truth bearing. He's a dad who brings truth to bear, but he also is kind and he, he lives it out. He may, they may not believe the gospel, but he is faithful to what his dad teaches and, and leads. There's, a, there's such a reverence for who their dad is that I'm not going to go out and go crazy and do those things just because of who my dad is. It's a beautiful thing. Dad is the same man at home that he is in church. He lives out what he teaches, and there's a respect and there's a love for dad. They're not full of dissipation and rebellion. And so the church is called the household of God, and we're to nurture it like a family. So look into our families to be a great test. How do you nurture your children? And if all you are is this tyrant who's exasperating your children, guess what you're going to do in the church of God? If you are exasperating your children to rebellion, rebellion and riotous living, you will not rule well the household of God, who is full of hormonal teenagers spiritually. The church of God has them. And if that's how you deal with it, you're, you're, you're just going to fail and you're going to be a miserable shepherd. Do you know what kind of man he is? Look, look at his family. And I believe this is to be kids in his home. Um, we kind of wrestled with this. I don't think it's the adult children who one day they, they move away, they're in another state or whatever, and they choose to kind of go their own path. But not dissipation and rebellion that would bring a reproach on his dad's ministry. So preaching that, uh, you're up there preaching and your kid is known as the town drunk and everyone mocks the name of God. I think there's a protection here for that. I had a young man I met with and uh, he, he said, you know, I, I, if I believed there was a God, I, I would be a Christian because of my mom and dad's testimony to me. He just said, it's, it's beautiful. And I just, man, there's something that I just, I think is sweet and leading in the testimony that they were to their son. Let's look then. The family is the first place to look. And I'm telling you, that's where you'll see as a man to shepherd his wife and his kids. And you'll, you'll see what kind of shepherd will he be in the church of God. Let's look at the character of the man. Paul breaks this down. I need to get moving by a list of things that uh, first he says, you should not be this. And then you should be this. The overseer must be above reproach, he says, as God's steward. A steward was someone who managed a house, and he would set the rules. He would manage all the people in the house. He was over all the resources. He had to see if the crops were successful or not. He corrected. He trained. He cared for if somebody was sick or wounded. The, the steward was over the whole house, and the church is a household, and God owns it, and we manage the house for him with all the gifts and the equipping of the saints and the oversight, correcting, feeding, nurturing, caring, praying, rebuking, the elder is called to manage the household of God. And one thing that cannot be missed as a steward, it doesn't belong to us. <laughs> Elders, it doesn't belong to us. We are accountable to God for how we manage it. So we are trying to be found trustworthy, trustworthy before God. So that's why we run it according to His Word. And therefore, we must be above reproach. And now he says, this is what it will look like, beginning in verse 7. He must not be self-willed. This cannot be one who is consumed with himself. If you're seeking for yourself as you shepherd the church of God, again, you will make shipwreck. You'll be stubborn, headstrong, arrogant. If it's all about you, do not aspire to this office. You cannot lead well when you are this way. Dividing your agenda, you're a know-it-all, you know the best way, you're just, everything is about you. It seems every person I meet aspiring to leadership, they all have this one thing. The, the, the Bible is all about the glory of God, amen. But the, 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 all we're to be about is discipleship, that's what the church needs. All we need is evangelism, and if we will go and do that right, the church will be right. All the church needs is missions. All the church needs is family ministry. All the church needs is your theology. And so every one of those is true. The church needs every one of them. But when you make that your will, and that is all the church is to be about, and you just take parts of Scripture that fit that and drive it like nothing else, that that's the only thing important, you are self-willed and you're dangerous to a leadership. 
Instead, a minister, we minister where God has made us strong, respecting one another with the components to faithfulness. That's for free. But I want you to get that as we come on an elder board and we all have different gifts and different bents and we work together for this great commission that God would be worshipped and glorified and adored. And when you think it's only one piece, you're going to get yourself in trouble. It is, the, it, is, it is the whole organic beauty of what God's design in a church. So uh, this is a real simple statement. It's not about you. This church is about the head. It's all about Jesus Christ. And we make much of him and we lift him up and we seek to obey him and what he wants and what he commands. And we find all of our strength in him. So it is, a, it is about him it's about your sheep that you listen to and you care for their needs. Guys, elders can't be self-willed. Secondly, not quick-tempered. I'm going to move real quick. Uh, you, you can't be quick to get angry at every little thing. Have you ever seen that where in a home where everyone's like, be careful, dad's a little bit touchy. You know, just hide, dad's, if you do anything, dad's going to blow, here it comes. It's just someone who, you're just always ready to get mad or angry. He, he is one that blows easily. He can, he can um, persevere under an elder that is one who can persevere under great frustration, under accusation, false accusation, under pride, stubbornness of sheep. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God, so an elder needs to be one who's not just always angry and blowing up and getting upset. You've got to be able to hold and be under control. Thirdly, you can't be addicted to wine. I preached on that in Ephesians 5.18, so I'm not going to park on it. But you're just not the good time Charlie guy living in the bars, drinking, because when you drink, what comes with it is sin, losing control. It's just an elder addicted to wine. You are never going to be above reproach, and you're never going to be a good leader in that. You're not pugnacious. It's a beautiful word. I like it, pugnacious. You're just a brawler. You're called to correct with gentleness those who are in opposition. There's really no place for a fighter in correcting. Resolve conflict peaceably and godly. An elder is not the pugnacious one. He is not fond of sordid gain. The guy that wants the quick buck. He doesn't care about how he makes the money. He just wants to make the money. He lacks integrity and honesty. The love of money is the root of all evil. This man, is, he's not controlled by money. He doesn't, that isn't what drives him. That's not why he does this. He's not after it. Money is not the issue. I've, I have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't care about money. Well, what should he be? That's what he shouldn't be. Now let's look quickly at what he should be. Is he, he's in verse 8, but he should be hospitable. And so it should be someone who your home is open. Really, my, my life is open. I love you. My home's open. Or bringing people in to love, minister, nurture, care. It's not a closed house. I won't invite that family. They got little kids and they'll ruin my carpet. And it just, this is a heart that's just broad, like God is. And just they're, they're hospitable. Their, their lives and their homes are open to the flock of God. They love what is good. That, is, that can be the lover of good men or lovers of goodness. And so I think a lover of good men is they, they're, they're friends and who they surround themselves with are good men, not the, not the, the gnarly. They, they love goodness. They, they just, they're lovers of what is good. And it, it's what drives them. It's what they care about. Thirdly, they're sensible. It's an interesting Greek word. It means to be right-minded that they're right-minded, they have saving thoughts. He's one who lifts his mind above what is trivial. They don't get lost in the scene. If you shepherd a flock of God by the scene, you will fail miserably. They are sensible. They think high thoughts about God and about life and about others and about purpose. He's not a jester. And so he's sound in his thinking. He has wisdom to handle difficult things. He, he's careful. He's thoughtful. He's wise. He's profound. He's deep. Timothy calls it prudent. So this, the elder must be one who's sensible. Fourthly, he's one who is just. Just. He, he has conduct that meets God's standard. He's, he's approved by God. He's justified. He, he's no, I love this. He's known as a man that God approves of. He's not just, uh, he's just in his dealings with men. Uh, Solomon, he makes godly decisions then in the flock. He's fair. And then fifthly, he's devout which means without stain. All areas of his life are unstained. 
If he ran for president, you, you couldn't find a stain on him. He is holy. He's a life set apart from sin. His affection for the things of God. So he's not perfect, but he wants to be. And his pursuits are to be. And he's devout. He's devout in his pursuit of God. And sixthly, he's a man who's self-controlled. He has power over himself. He is temperate. He can control himself, which will be very important in this office. He's not controlled by anything but his God, the Spirit. He's not mastered by anything. And I think that is something to always be in prayer over. Is there something that has mastered and controlling you? You won't be able to shepherd the flock of God. Self-controlled man. So here is the man. Here is the man. Uh, next week we're going to look at verse 9 alone um, about how, that he holds fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so he'll be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So we'll look at that characteristic this week. But what we just looked at, this is the man that God wants to lead his church. And I think this kind of leadership, it's very important to the Lord of the church. This matters to Christ. Men of integrity who seek this God above all else. And it is seen and manifested in his family and his character and his dealings with other people. God wants all of us to be this way. And that is why he gives us elders then to be models, to be examples. They'll never be perfect, but, but they pray. They, they, I, every year I come in January 1, should I step down? We take these serious, we wrestle with them, we deal with them before God. To run after Jesus with all of my gifts and weaknesses and defects, to set an example of a life that has been given to Jesus Christ, that's what we need from our friends. They know God and they're pursuing Him and their, their teaching is to make Him known and people are growing into the image of Him. And I just believe we can't lower this standard. We can't say, well, there's only one guy in the church that meets this, and you said two elders, so let's find one more. I, I, we can't lower the standard. This is God's standard. We need this kind of leadership more than ever in our land. And so young men, do you want to aspire to be these kind of men? It won't happen just wanting and hoping one day you wake up being like it. It is going to take diligence and perseverance and discipleship to start right now. I want to be kind of man. Young boys, right now, listening to your Sunday school teachers, your parents, find someone to mentor you. There's always someone older. I got a bunch of college kids who love pouring in to young men. So right now, do you want to be these kind of men? And young women, I'm telling you, this is what it takes to lead a home and a family. These characteristics are what you want for the man who's going to lead your house. We're starting up. This is just real quickly, we're, we're starting up a training institute uh, that next week, I think, in the bulletin, there'll be a meeting after church. But what we want to do is train a man in hermeneutics, the scriptures, and, and I'll tell you right now, just that doesn't make a man an elder. What, what, what did you just learn today? Did you just see all the characteristics we just went over for an elder? There's one at the very end that says you can teach the Word of God and refute false teachers. Do you know what that tells me? I went, uh, you go off to seminary and they teach you how to teach the word. And then you graduate and they say, you're ready for ministry. And you go off to be an elder and guess what? I had no clue. I, I did not have these qualities. And just because I had a degree, now you're a pastor, that isn't how it works. So what, what I see is if we're going to raise up elders, it's all of these things. And it's going to be training in the word of God. You've got to be able to cut it and divide it rightly but it is working on these qualities, these characters. How, how are you going to lead your home? How are you going to lead your wife? All of those things we want to pour into this training institute and the training of the men. And so we want to raise up men like this and Titus to take the mantle to lead the churches into the nearness of Jesus Christ and His beauty. And so I pray for our young men, and I'm going to ask you as a church to start praying as we begin this training ministry. we got many young men that want to join in this, and I pray that God would give us grace to raise up these kind of guys. And I, I want to raise up young kids like this too. I, I want the youngins and that we really pour into the men 
and, and, and the godly women and that we have marriages that will change the world and do mighty things. So let's stay devoted to the right thing. Anything this morning is we've got to be committed to be these kind of men as elders and to bring these kind of men in as elders. Because I just think too many churches, they bring in people who are elders, who make a lot of money, who are very prestigious, who can influence people. All of those things don't mean squat as an elder. What matters is, do you know God? And I really believe the gift of teaching is when you teach, people, people know God and they, they're conformed to His image. It's not how many things you can connect and all the data. It's the Word of God comes and people grow and they're built up into the image of Christ. And so we, we want that to be this church. And we, we're going to fight for that. Go And God has blessed us with some amazing men that shepherd this flock. They seek the face of God and they have lives that are manifesting it. And I, I love knowing them intimately and being dear friends with them. And they're losing their lives. What this description is, an elder has to lose his life. Paul said, I'm a doulos. It's no longer about me. I'm a slave, and I serve this body. I give my life to it. Let's thank God for those gifts and those callings and that we'll all be blessed and benefit from that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you appoint elders over churches. And I thank you that you have qualities to look at so we won't make mistakes. God, it can't just be a guy who's smart and knows doctrine. That can never be the quality of an elder. God, it's got to be all of these attributes and characteristics that we've just looked at. And so we see that no human can be this. God, the only way is through the power of your gospel, your power, God, beholding Christ, being metamorphosed into his image to begin to reflect these things. And so I pray for the elders, God, that you would protect their secret place, that you would protect their integrity and their families and their, their doctrine and their truth. God, I pray that you protect their hearts, that they love this flock deeply, and that they would never become sour or embittered. God, that we would do this with great joy in shepherding the flock of God. Lord, I thank you for this calling. I thank you for this gift of what you've just described. And I love young men who are wanting to go into this. Lord, I pray that you will be with them now, that you'll begin shaping their character and their integrity this very day. Lord, that they would come out and be separate from this world. Lord, give them mentors one-on-one, -on -one, pouring into them, helping them grow. And then I pray, Lord, that this, in the next chapter that the whole church will learn how to do this with each other. God, lead us into discipleship relationships where we are pouring in the glories and the beauties of Christ into each other's hearts, that we are evangelizing and edifying and encouraging with the blessed hope of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for this word. And I thank you for the men you've raised up in this body. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.